Greetings, Saints. This is Dr. Terry A. Webb welcoming you to an outstanding annual Youth Day celebration 2023. Sit back, relax, and enjoy as the community and the youth of the community and of Christian Unity Baptist Church, members, families, and friends have come together to celebrate the Lord this weekend. Be sure to watch this clip all the way to the end.
20, verses 12. We, we ask that you please stand for the reading of the God's Word, if, if you can. The scripture is Exodus, verse, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12.
Somebody lived in one of these houses six months. It's a long time. Six to nine months. It's it, a year. It's highly transient. So we're, we're working on ways to outreach, and we're still doing it. Even work with the council, and I even pulled a record. It's highly transient. Uh, now, uh, down Grassmere and Del Mar over here, this end, no. But when you get to the other end, it's highly transient. It's a lot of rental property. Nothing wrong with that. Because if it weren't for rental property, we would have been really homeless a couple of times. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I just want to say thank you to all of you who came out this morning and who, uh, I mean yesterday, and everything just went so well. And I'm going to turn it over to our one of our youth leaders, okay. the indomitable, the magnificent, the tireless, okay. all right. DeAngela Perry. Okay. All right. Okay, so. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, Reverend um, Dr. Terry A. Webb has already covered everything, but I just want to say, um, and I'm not going to be before you long, I promise, but I just want to say that, boy, I just thank God so much for each and every one of you. If you did anything to make yesterday become a reality for, for everything, thank you so very much from the bottom of our hearts, because there's no I in team. Teamwork makes the dream work, and boy, we were out there yesterday with this kid. And you know what? I thank God for it. Each and every year, we see how it gets better and better and better. And it is always the case. I always ask God, whoever's supposed to be there, let him be there. That's right. And be sure do let whoever's supposed to be there be there. And we had a good time. Now, not just the kids. <laughs> the youth. I'm going to let them see this. But the adults, did we have fun? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. We had fun. And that's what it's all about. Having fun in the name of Jesus. From the time we got here, pulling all this stuff out, we had a crew then, we had a crew throughout, we had a crew at the end. 
So I'm just so thankful. And in my um, co-partner's um, absence, I know she feels the same way and love and appreciate each, each and every one of you as well. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. And I wanted to also thank um, the parents of our praise dancers, we got Sister Missy and then my two sisters, because they allow their children to come and be a part of what they do. And so, um, you know, they, they take that time out the dropping off and the picking up, because that's what it takes. Are you, if they're minors, they don't drive, right? So they, unless you put that time in with your child to bring them to be a part of what we do, they, they, they don't have that option. So I'm so thankful to all our um, parents who take the time to do that. And we're looking for many more. God bless you all. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All that. And you know what? Something else, too. You know we're going to be doing that. And I really, I really have to give a shout out to someone who's infirmed and has balance issues. Not saying that everybody that participated did not do it. But Dean Gordon was here bright and early yesterday. Amen. And, and, and he was here. Right? So I'm not saying he take anything to anybody else. But y'all, he can't do a lot. Not that he don't do a lot, but he can't do a lot of stuff like that. But he showed unfolding folders and chairs. And, he got the and I love and appreciate him for it. Because ministry is not just being in front of a congregation. You have missed the whole mark. Yes. And on your way to a bad place, if you think that this is it, it's being amongst people in the vineyard, shaking hands, serving those who are in need, and lifting people up in prayer and in exhortation, acknowledging them how well they are doing. Because it took a lot of pressure off me with our deacon, uh, Beasley being our resident ex executive chef here <laughs> and getting there. I learned someone like the grill. I just dumped the whole bag in there, though. He, he ordered the charcoals and the thing. And, and I was like, why you do that? Just mm, and call it a day. I like seeing the fire shoot up like yeah. that. And uh, I know I'm the only one in here like that. No, Nobody else in here like that. Just don't do it on your front porch. Don't be good. <laughs> now, but uh, just to say that, and young people, just continue to push on. That I'm about to sit down here. I know that the, uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce him later, but you know, it's like my son, my son in God as well, uh, Reverend Ronald Jones, is going to come to you this morning. I see he has his lovely wife here, the My Taisha <laughs> Young Jones. Will you stand, the oh, My Taisha okay. Young Jones? <laughs> The young lady came in, and, and when I was teasing about the 1981 on her shirt, and, and uh, that was a long time ago for some of us, but uh, she was talking about it. I said, I can't say 86, because I've been knowing them since they were kids, and they're not 20 years old. They're 19. But my math is bad, but uh, it, is, it is what it is. But you know what? For the day, I want y'all to think about something. Pay close attention to what's going on, young people. When you don't know what to what. When you don't know what to do, do, do what you, what is the thing again? What to do when you don't know what to do. All right, thank you. What to do when you don't know what to do. All right, hey, it's hard being 29. One day, y'all will know. One day, you know, what to do when you don't know what to do. And I stand here to tell you today, myself, young people. I never would have thought I had a college degree. I wouldn't think I had three or four, co four college degrees. I never would have thought I would be where I was if I had to listen to the people who were trying to tell me how to go somewhere they had never been. That'll hit you later. Mm -hmm. Also, too, another thing I know this too is that in order to get to where I am, I still look back now over my life. Mm -hmm. And I want you to always think about things like this. Don't ever focus on the problem in front of you. Make it a point to reflect upon the victories that God has given you yes. and got you to the point that you're at right now so that you will know what to do. How did you get to where you are? You got there because you trust God. You got there because you obey God. You got there because you know the word of God. And the next thing is that you need mentoring. You need mentoring by people who are people of God, mm -hmm. not people who are of this world. Yeah. I know we all want to be mentored by Jay-Z and Beyonce, because mm -hmm. they be there. But we don't know, as they used to say back in the day, the old folks used to say, the grass is always greener where? On the other side of the street. And I don't know what's going on in their world, in their home. I, I, I'm not, I might not be willing to do most of the things they had to do or can do what they did. But I do know this. God has a purpose and a plan and a destiny for each one of you in your life. And if you allow God into your life, 
and not listen to people with trivialities and dysfunctional ideas and brokenness. Because the one thing that we as a people have a tendency to do, we have a tendency to listen to people who are broken. Mm -hmm. And we listen to them and we get caught up in their mess. We think that we can solve everybody's problems. You know what? Being happy is a choice. Mm -hmm. Being joyful is a promise from God if you trust him. Amen. So as we continue on in this service, know this, that if you want to know what to do, always look to Jesus. Yeah. And patiently wait. Y'all heard this expression. I said, those who what? Wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. So if you ain't tired, you ain't supposed to be blessed. You're supposed to be tired. That means you're supposed to be working. Faith without what? Is Works is dead. So you're supposed to be getting out here, getting your hands dirty, going out here doing this. And whatever you do, don't look at any opportunity as an opportunity for you to be bougie. I love it when they send these young men to me who are pre-released from prison, and they tell me I won't work at a burger place. I just tell them to get out, go back to jail. Mm -hmm. right. We're trying to get you started. You've never worked anywhere. You don't have any work skills. Right. And we're trying to break out of this mentality that I can't work for anybody. When you find three people who are really successful, yeah. All right. Come on. let me know. They work in the entertainment business. Most people who have their own personal business that's not 50 or 60 years old is barely scraping by. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for public assistance or being married to the right person. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. They will be outdoors. Get an education. Align yourself with powerful, influential people who are willing to pour life into you and not destroy your dreams. And continue to push on for the prize that I call it. Call upon us old people. Because sometimes we hit our head in a way you never have to hit your head. Sometimes we've been through pains that you never have to go through. Use us up. Be a sanguine with sweat as we help you on this journey. Because somebody prayed for me. Yes. Somebody prayed for each and every last one of us that has made it here that's over 50, 55, 60 years old. Sub 70 years old. Somebody prayed for for us. Amen. And, the, and the thing, the last thing, I'm going to sit down. Don't know what to do? Your friends. If your friends ain't going nowhere, you need to leave them where they are. Amen. And go out and get your destiny. Amen. All my friends are professionals. I don't mess around with people that don't want nothing. I don't. And it's not looking down upon anybody. It's not putting yourself in a position you were never destined to be in. Right. And all my friends have master's degrees, college degrees, they're professionals. I don't have time. I don't know about y'all, but I know what it is to be broke. I know what it is to not live in a house without utilities. I know what it is to not necessarily have enough to eat or have to patch your clothes up and sleep in them yes. on the floor or on a pallet. I know what that's about. And my job is to make sure I put everyone I love in a situation so they never have to endure that. And if the people around you don't want anything, you don't want them around you. And then I'm done. If you're the smartest person in your group, get a new group. Amen. Amen. It ain't no confidence. I know I'm the smartest one in my social circle. Well, everybody's smarter than you because they take it from you and you can't give you nothing. <laughs> I don't want to be the smartest. I just want to know what I know. Mm -hmm. So I can help and contribute when it's time to do it. And get you a friend that's an attorney. You'll understand that later when you get older. <laughs> you may need them. Uh, as we continue on in this, I do believe that we are at the point where we give it to God as God has blessed us. Correct, right? Oh, it is. I'm bad. I thought y'all did that. All right, announcements then. Announcement clerks, please come up. Hey, y'all, I ate hot dogs yesterday. I'm still am. And they were Nathan's. <laughs> Nathan Hot Dog will make me moan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As, as has been previously stated a couple of times, today is Steve Sunday. Yes. And the theme for this Steve Sunday is what to do when you don't know what to do. From Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and learn not to lean. Learn and lean. For July, we have the Women's Ministry sponsoring Romney Sale on Saturday, July 15th from 12 to 3 p.m. And also we have church anniversary on Sunday, July 23rd. More information is TBD. Bible study is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Please make sure that Pastor Webb has your email address so that you can have the link. Sunday school is at 10 a.m. every Sunday. 
On our prayer list, we have Sister Paige, Mother Aunt Bradley, Deacon Tilly, Sis, uh, Sister Gibson, Deacon McCoy, and Brother Bowen. And we ask that all of your announcements that you have for the church please sent, be sent into Sister Webb by Thursday so they can be announced at the next upcoming Sunday service. Thank you. Amen. 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 service. This is the time that we now give, right? Oh, thank you. Uh, see, I need direction sometimes. Uh, some of this is the point where the financial committee, the deacons, the others, everybody come forward. As you give unto God, as God has blessed you. And also, too, another thing, too. I was overcome yesterday when we got into the church and we saw all of the love that was shown for our children in our program of the things that we have amassed for the youth and for them yesterday. Actually, y'all have blessed this church so much that primarily when we have a church picnic, we really ain't got to do a lot. It's a beautiful thing. So then we're all right, and we had everything we need. We had brand name everything that all these had. <laughs>
ask that you bless all who, all who gave and all who have desires to give. Amen. 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 Also, too, thanks to God, we'd be remiss if y'all noticed the coffee tape is gone in the back. Amen. God, to God be the glory. We can now sit everywhere in the sanctuary. The trustees have done an awesome job in orchestrating and making sure that the building is being restored. Let's give them a round of applause. They have been here every day, all day, with the contractors, getting this stuff back up to where it's going to be. And prayerfully, we will have a fresh coat of paint and everything inside the uh, sanctuary, as well as down downstairs. Things have been uh, repaired excellently. So as you see, that's why. It was fascinating, though. I was here when they put the bricks in. It's like, boy, I wish I had to pay attention to that. But these guys are doing this and talking. And it's just amazing how they do it. They did it, and it was done. It's done very well. I'm not saying stop down there and visit yet, because they still we got a whole bunch of stuff in the hallway still. So be careful going downstairs, down the hallway towards my office. The men's room is usual. Just go in there and come out, because there's still stuff in there. Ladies' room, we've never bought y'all bathroom because y'all dangerous. It's all right. It's all right. Y'all bathroom is totally clear and free to use. We just want y'all to know that just be careful when you go down there. But everything is coming along actually a little bit ahead of schedule. We're not quite sure when it will be done, but we know it will be done very soon. The painting is commenced. The electrical stuff is commenced. We've got new ceiling fans going up. we got a whole lot of new stuff coming up downstairs. And then uh, just to know that we will do that. And uh, to let you know this too, that uh, the church anniversary, we had been talking about it because we didn't know how long this repairs were going to take. Everybody with me, follow along with this? And so we got to make sure that we're totally clear before we have somebody in this church for us to fellowship with. Uh, we're family, so we can come to each other's house when it ain't in order. Uh, we don't invite people in. But know this uh, God loves you, I love you, we're not going to do anything. We, we can't do nothing about it. As we get ready now to go to the throne of grace, right? With our altar call. And you know, the precious Lisa is going to take us to the throne of grace. You can stand where you are. <laughs> You can hold hands. May 11th, before we was lifted. And uh, won't you come down front? Give unto God that God has blessed you and letting him know that you're thankful for all that he has done for you. God has been good to you. Mighty good to you. Mighty good to this church and everyone around us. All hearts and minds clear. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Our Father, we have in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we just thank you for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. We just want to ask that you provide us with the guidance and opportunities and resources to make this week a good one. Lord, just thank you, thank you so much. We cannot continue to thank you enough. We ask that you just clear all danger and chaos away from our lives and just bring us closer to you, Lord. We ask that you just please forgive us of all our sins so that we can live a peaceful life. Lord, you are amazing, and thank you for everything you've done. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
chosen people. <laughs> See, God's got a purpose. And I know he's able
for living. Amen. God bless you all. I was, I was sitting down here, sitting, you know, up here you can't see everything. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you've been up here, you can tell. I was not thinking, I, I just wanted to uh, be mindful of this. We have not seen Mother Bradley in about three, four months. She's here. Amen. God bless her. And you know something else too is she brought her grandkids with her, Amen. and that's a beautiful thing. And that doesn't mean we have been reaching out to her, but she's a woman of mystery and international travel, so we catch up with her when we can. <laughs> and you know what? And yesterday, I'd be remiss if I didn't think about the Herculean effort that was put forth by some individuals who were not here last year or probably whatever. I own Brother Hardrick. Y'all might not recognize him. Stand up, brother. He was here yesterday with me, bright and early, slinging tables with yeah. Sister Davis. Yeah. He was like me. He had the garbage man gloves on. We went there and got it. And we went there and pulled our table. Sister Davis was here. And she has OCD. She swept out the garage. And, 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 and we just came together. Yeah. Sister Young brought her grandsons and them here. And we had a uh, 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 mother Ray and all them brought people here. We were just, it was just, I was just sitting out thinking about the high of seeing these children dance. Just brought to remembrance everything that transpired yesterday. Yes. Y'all, I'm, I'm sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Reverend Nathaniel Foster Jr. smiled yesterday. <laughs> we had my sister Nene keeping up with the condiments. Oh, by the way, we have a new office now in the church called the Condiment Cop. That's oh. Sister Kirk. <laughs> and, her, and her sergeant at arms is Sister Rose. <laughs> Tell y'all about when was that ketchup made? How old is that mustard? Is that still mayo? That relish is a little too green. <laughs> I ain't mad. Tell me out. I'm a man. If it don't smell too bad and don't have moss on it, I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just glad that y'all are around here, but it was good to have somebody like Brother Hardrick here with me and all of us working and going and all of us slinging these tables and pulling them out and our condiment cops and everybody and Sister Davis with her OCD sweeping out there in that garage and y'all know that garage ain't been swept since about this time last year and hold on and they even put everything back in their decent in order. I don't know who did it but God bless you. I'm telling you, because it was rough going in there. I felt like I landed on the moon trying to go in there and reach for stuff. But you know what? We got it together. And I was just thinking, as they were dancing, these kids got caught up in the spirit on the way out. I thought the Reverend Foster's just smiling right now. He's just skinning and grinning, thinking about all the things that you all are doing right now and how we are coming together as a family and working out and getting it done. Uh, uh, Sister DeAngelo's. Sons came, people came out, and we got it done. Yesterday, y'all don't know how much. I don't worry. I'm not a person to worry. I'm not. I'm not a worry. My wife can tell you that. I'm like, if I can't, I can't. If I can't, I can't. Right. I'm just really glad and elated that when I got here at 1030, and it's supposed to start at 11, there were people here. Mm-hmm. Brother Robert know he worked, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brother Robert worked it out yesterday. Actually, this morning, I got here to help him take all the stuff out the hallway. It was done. I said, bro, I'm going to meet you in the morning. When you get here, we're going to take I come here. You know, I got my workout uniform on now. I was ready to move some stuff, get it downstairs. He's like, I'm done, Pastor. I'm like, so I just wanted to personally thank those individuals. Because y'all moved me yesterday, y'all moved this event, y'all served heaven and earth, and t- literally, we moved heaven and earth out of that garage. <laughs> so, with all that being said, I do not want to belabor the point, because this is the time, the designated time for the man of the hour to come and bring us a word from the Lord. And I've been knowing this young man three-fourths of his life, and I've seen him evolve into a magnificent example of what it means to be a Christian man. He is not just a Christian man, he's also a father. He's also one who studies the word unrelentlessly. He's also somebody who works all the time, as well as someone who even has some musical abilities here at nine men. He is somebody who is willing to step up on faith and give God a try. He's not afraid to move, he's not afraid to be married, because 
because I know he married a dynamo and he still married her even though he knows who she is. And I, I love her too. I can say that. This man is a bad man. He hails from somewhere off Superior St. Clair area, so we know that he knows gunfire as well as praise. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> we know that. Uh, with all of that being said, I cannot say the whole name of his church because it's about 40 words long. But he knows what it is, and, he, and it really is. And my wife and I were like, really? <laughs> it's like an Easter speech. But it is what it is. <laughs> but he's my son. I can do that. But I'm going to present the song and introduce the others. None other than our Youth Day speaker for 2023, Reverend Ronald Jones. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, before I get started, the, the praise dance. I don't, I, don't see, I don't see one purple shirt. There's like three or four of them left. They changed. They changed. Okay, I'm going to ask y'all the question when the rest of your, when the rest of your entourage show up. Okay. I, I want to know something. I was watching y'all. I said, i got to ask this question. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm not a singer, but I've had a song in my spirit for the better part of a month, and I can't get it out of my head. Because I'm not a singer, I need you all to sing with me. Don't y'all stare at me, Goofy. <laughs> and leave me high and dry. Put me me flat, please. Go to Old Magnify the Lord. I know you know that, right? Oh, Magnify the Lord. For he is worthy to be praised. Oh, Magnify the Lord. Magnify the Lord. For he is worthy to be Let me ask a question. 
the, the young folks still ain't bad. What are they changing the picture? My God, today, you know, you think you just wear jeans and a t-shirt. They couldn't know what they used to dress. I'm trying to stall. Pray long and sing long just to get the men here. What else can I do besides preach before they walk in here? <laughs> Doing everything but preaching. So I want to offer a word of clarity. Um, Dr. Webb is correct. The ministry that I am affiliated with does have a law name. It's Refiners Fire World Outreach Center. We call it ROFWOC, R-F-W-O-C. That is not my church. I'm affiliated with that church. That's a church I belong to for more than a decade in Kansas City. Uh, they're my spiritual covering. I still have an association with them. Every time I show up in Kansas City, I minister and I preach there. Uh, we collaborate a lot, but it is not my church. I did, however, just recently start officially a ministry. Um, I've been avoiding doing it, been saying I wasn't going to do it, didn't want to do it, had no interest in doing it. But God has a way of ignoring your pleas and your cries and bringing about his will regardless of what you think you're going to do. Uh, I've literally had people who are not Christian, don't profess to be Christian, say they don't believe the Bible, but say that if you start a church, I'll join. Did you all hear what I said? I don't think Dr. Little, it'll get them on the ride home, baby. Non-Christians who still have not professed Christ and argue against the Bible, but still come to my Bible study. And ask when the next one is. All right. All right. And fuss at me when I'm not consistent with it. <laughs> Jump down my throat when we ain't seen you post or nothing in a while, brother. I'm looking for I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. And, and we gotta get out of this thinking. I know I'm about to say something that's gonna mess with people's theology. Uh, <laughs> I'm not terribly interested in offering people Jesus right away. Yeah, see how quiet it got, sir? See how quiet? If I start with Jesus and you're preconditioned to not believe in him, you're not going to hear a word I say. If I start with the Bible and you're already preconditioned not to believe the Bible, you're not going to believe a word I say. But if I treat you with love and dignity and honor and respect and I show an interest in you and your personal life and I ask questions about you and I follow up with you and I open up my resources to you, you're more inclined to believe what I might have to say. These people that are coming to my house and logging in, these are people I built relationships with. Amen. Half of them didn't even know I was a Christian, not because I don't live the life, but because I don't run around quoting scripture every five minutes and walk around with a crucifix and honk if you love Jesus. But I, I just I just display it. I just display the love of God, and they're drawn to that. I had one woman... <laughs> Used to be a Christian, belonged to a church, was an administrator at the church for years. And she said she saw all kinds of mess come in and out of the door, right. which is why she walked away. Uh -huh. That woman stood in my house, tipsy on alcohol, uh -huh. and said, if you keep doing this and I keep coming, you never know. I might just, and then she stopped herself. Uh -huh. And I knew what she was going to say. Uh -huh. I might just come back to God. Now, she's standing there next to her husband, who's a bigger heathen than she is, and both of them are standing there under the spirit of the Lord while I tips you on alcohol telling me you need to keep doing this. You see, we got to get out of this religious thinking that the only place to do ministry is in these four walls, and ministry has to look and sound a very specific way, and if it doesn't look the way we're used to, then it's not ministry. I have no interest in preaching to Christians. And that's boring to me. It's boring to come into an environment and say what I know y'all want to hear, knowing I'm going to get an amen, I'm going to get a little check, and I'm going to go home. That's boring. What's interesting to me is talking to the folks that don't want to come to church, don't believe in God, ain't looking at the Bible, don't believe the Bible. But I'm so, I make for such a compelling case that they're least willing to have a conversation with me. I had to laugh, Dr. Ware, when you were standing up here because I had literally, I was, I was putting on my jacket. And I was listening to some music in my bedroom this morning, and I thought to myself, preaching and teaching is actually easy. It's a muscle you flex, you, and you get used to it. There's a cadence, and there's a pattern to it, and even people that aren't terribly proficient at it get comfortable with it if they do it enough. So after a while, 
Format, there, there's a formula to writing a sermon for the most part. You have to rely on God and you have to know the word. But there's, there's a formula that I follow when I write my sermons. And there's a formula that I follow when I write lesson plans. And I kind of know what my destination is. And so when I'm writing a sermon, I'm literally just writing the roadmap to get to the destination that I, I want to get you on to. That's easy. You know what's real hard? Standing there and defending the Bible in your house. That's hard. You know what's real hard? Dealing with all the neighborhood kids coming down to your house because you're the neighborhood dad uh, and you wonder where their parents are. And it's not that their parents aren't paying attention, it's because their parents trust you and they know there's a safe haven. So I look up and now there's 15 kids outside my door. And now I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with them. That's hard. So I laughed when you said ministry is not standing behind this no, desk. Right. Ministry is what I'm doing Monday through Saturday out in my community, yes. at the job, at home, mm -hmm. when I'm with my family, yes. when I'm dealing with the neighborhood kids. That's what ministry is. Yes. This is the easy part. So did my young people come back to India? Yes. It's, okay, so that see y'all got on layers. That's what took y'all so long. <laughs> y'all got on like four or five different layers of fabric. So I, I, first of all. I want to commend you three. You all did a phenomenal job up here. I, what I saw was three young ladies that were passionate about what they're doing. And you take it seriously. And you were excited about it. You put your all into it. So I just want to honor you publicly and let you know that I was blessed by your ministerial expression. Amen. And then I do have a question. Did y'all decide intentionally to get long hair and wear it down so that y'all was dancing? Because I'm going to show y'all what I saw. So, was that, a, was that a conscious choice or did it just work out? You, you, ain't, you ain't sitting down in that chair and say, mm, I gotta dance Sunday, so I'm gonna do my hair at least halfway down my back. You did it. You did that. You did that. Was it, it just happened like that? Well, y'all did your thing, and let's give the young people a little hand. I guess I should keep the speech for I'm at home. Is that alright for me? Because I'm at home. So I can, I, I can crack jokes on y'all. I can crack jokes on y'all. So. If you have a social media account, raise your hand. Any kind of social media account. If you have any social media, raise a high to that young people. I already know. You're, you're on something. You're on Snapchat or you're on Instagram. Us older folks who are up, you're on Facebook. <laughs> Ain't it crazy how they look at us crazy for still being on Facebook? I, I, the old people are. The old people on Facebook, they on Snapchat and Instagram. So let me see it one more time. If you have any kind of social media, like even if you have a LinkedIn account for professional purposes, raise your hand high. LinkedIn. Okay. So I see more hands up than I see down. And if you don't, that's fine. If you do, that's fine. This is not a knock against social media. This is not criticizing social media. We are in what's called the digital age. Are y'all looking at your social media accounts while I'm preaching? That's your wife. That's your wife, sir. The first lady of the church. Trying to see how many likes she got on her last post. So I believe today is Youth Day, and the, the, the thing is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? And the scripture text is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Yes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And what will He do? He shall direct your path. Amen. So I told you we're in the digital, we're in the digital age. We can't, we're, we're still in what's called the, the information age, but it is transitioned to the digital age because if you look around, most people have some form of a device that they can access and they can access all kinds of information. And then in addition to having access to the unlimited information, they can create social media profiles and they can follow other, follow other people and see what other people are doing, how they're living their lives, what they're teaching, what they're saying, right? So we have unlimited, unfettered access to all this information. And on one end, that's a good thing because that's made us, we are at the height of human intelligence because nothing is hidden anymore. 
If I make a statement, you can literally Google it while I'm talking and see if what I'm saying is true or not. Literally while I'm talking. Before, you had to go to church, listen to the preacher preach, and then you got to go home and halfway remember what he said, and then hope that you had a thesaurus, you don't even know what a thesaurus is, or a dictionary, and a Bible, and a concordance to look it up and study and see if what the preacher man said was true or not. Nowadays, you don't have to do all that. You can literally just go online and look up anything. But on the other end, the negative effect it's had is there's two. One, it's made everybody a subject matter expert. It's made everybody a subject matter expert. All I have to do is create a profile on the right platform, have the right camera and the speakers, and be charismatic enough, and I can literally say anything, and thousands of people will follow me and believe whatever I say. And that is dangerous. The other thing it's done is it's created a culture where I'm no longer getting my validation from anything valuable. I'm getting my validation from how many unknowns look at something that I posted and acknowledge it with a heart or a like or a comment or a reshare. And if I'm not getting enough likes or hearts or comments or reshares, then I feel like I don't matter. Before, it was what you did that actually mattered. Now it's what you post. So there's a dichotomy with this new digital age that we're in. And the reason why I'm, I'm bringing it up is because when we talk about trusting in the Lord, you have to consider why is it that people are actually not coming to God, they're moving away from Him? It's because they have access to so, many, so much other information that contradicts the things of God. And so I don't need to trust in God, I can just trust in social media. I don't need to trust in the Word, I can just go online and listen to my favorite influencer. I don't need to trust in the things of God. I can just get on YouTube or whatever else and learn how to do this, that, and the other. And it tricks me into believing that I don't actually need God because I have access to all the information that I need. And again, that's dangerous. Let me just tell you all, for all of you all with social media, reels, stories, shorts, clips are not a good source of education. Neither are memes. The problem with the meme is it can convey a thought very quickly in one, maybe two sentences. I post them all the time. Just different things that, that, that occur to me related to Christianity, the Christian lifestyle. But the problem is I've been attacked more on my memes than I have my videos because people will read that one sentence and assume what I do or don't know. They take away the ability, they take away nuance. What do I mean by nuance? I mean, every thought, every idea, every belief system has a nuance to it. Everything is not black and white. For instance, the, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Well, if you look at the King James Version, the word does say kill, but a better translation is murder. Thou shalt not murder, which is unlawful killing, right? So if I put up on the me, thou shalt not kill, I'm going to get attacked. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And I'm not suggesting that there's never a justifiable time to take a life. Because let me tell you something. Show up to my house trying to hurt my family. All right. Now, I'm skinny, but don't let these glasses fool you. Don't let these glasses fool you when it comes to my family. I become a bear when it comes to my family. And I might break, according to your perception, a command. Because I've taken away nuance. I read the words and I assume mm. I understand everything that it means. See, we're taught and told what to think. We are not taught how to think. We're not told how to think, how to process, how to be emotionally intelligent, how to be in intellectually honest with ourselves, to follow rational processes to come to the conclusions that we do. If it's somebody we like that says and we take it as true. So, the social media can only take you so far. Now, I have a question. What do you do when you're faced with situations that social media can't answer? What do you do when you're facing the death of a loved one, or you're severely disappointed, or you face a violation or a betrayal of someone who you trusted, you placed faith in? What do you do when you're faced with a serious life decision about the next phase of life? Where am I going to go to school? Where am I going to work? 
Am I going to stay in this city or am I going to move to another city? I'm sick of my job and I want to quit, but what do I do? Social media can't answer those kinds of questions. They, they simply can't. What do you do when you feel hopeless or confused or frustrated, restless, just antsy, uncertain, and worried about what's next? Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 gives us some clues about what to do. So if you look at there's four there's four clues. The first one is trust in the Lord with all your heart. And that word and is a powerful conjunction, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What does that mean? If I had to break it down to its most simple terms, trusting in the Lord with all your heart simply means I acknowledge that in this life, there I'm going to be bombarded with information now more than ever. We're in the middle of the information age with access to technology that causes us to access that information instantaneously. I'm going to be bombarded with people's thoughts and belief systems and ideas and the patterns and the paths that they walked that worked for them that maybe got them some results that I want to emulate. Maybe there's a house I, a kind of lifestyle I want to live and that person's already living that lifestyle. So I want to find out what they did. I'm going to be bombarded with all these ideas. I'm going to be bombarded. Uh, oh boy. How old are you? I guess I got to be careful about high words, certain things. Because I have. If they were all teenagers, I'd kind of just say what I want to say, but they're not all teenagers. I'm going to be presented with ideas about my identity from the world. I'm going to be told certain things about who I am, who I'm not, and who I can and cannot be from the world. I'm going to be presented with ideas about relationships and what are and are not acceptable relationships from the world. I accept that. I can't control the fact that I'm going to be bombarded with that information. But when I'm trusting in the Lord, what that means is I have to weigh whatever information is being presented to me against what the Word of God says. And if they don't match, well, I got to go with what the Word says. Now, here's the thing. If I don't know the Word, I have no basis of comparison. If I'm not in my Bible and I don't know what God thinks about any particular topic then I don't know if what I'm thinking and believing and pursuing is right or wrong because I don't have anything to compare it to. Now, I would love to say listen to your parents, listen to your grandparents, listen to your aunties and your uncles, but the reality of it is that all of us, every single last one of us, are fallible. All of us make mistakes. We all don't know everything. We all have some kind of belief system that is ungodly. We, every single one of us, every single one of us has at least one belief system, one ideology that contradicts the word of God. So it's not enough to listen to your elders, which you should be doing. You've got to go straight to the source. God wants to reveal himself to you. And when we talk about trusting in the Lord, trust is built on relationship. I'm not going to trust God simply because somebody tells me to. I'm going to trust God because I've experienced him for myself and I know that he's trustworthy. You all get that? I'm not just talking to you three, I'm talking to everybody, but y'all are going to be on the front row so y'all in the hot seat. So trust in the Lord with all your heart, meaning I can't decide to trust God when I want to be blessed, but I don't want to trust God when he wants me to be obedient. Amen. I can't just trust God when I need a miracle, but I don't want to trust God when it comes to whether or not I tithe. I trust God when I need a new job or a new opportunity or I haven't done my due diligence. It looks like I'm going to fail this class, so I'm going to pray real quick and ask God to bring back to memory all the, the little bit of information that I have so I can hopefully pass this test. But I don't want to trust God when God says be consistent and be faithful in those little things and be a good student consistently so that you can get the grades that you want. Trusting God with my whole heart means in every single area, I'm consulting God about what he wants me to do. And then that's what I do. But it's not just enough to say trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's a conjunction, the word and, meaning it's great if I say I trust God with my whole heart. But how many of us can say that there's been times where we, we believed in God, we know God was real, 
We love him. I trust the Bible. The Bible is God's word. The Bible is the ultimate authority here on earth. But I also have my, my view, my, my perception, my desires, the direction I would like to go. And can, can any of us older folk admit that there have been times where we knew God was real and we still did what we wanted to do? Where we knew what the Bible said about a thing, but we still went in the direction that we wanted to go? So that conjunction and means they work hand in hand. I trust in the Lord with all my heart and I choose not to lean to my own understanding. There's, there's a passage that says there's a right that there's a way that seems right to a man, but at the end of it is destruction. So you're going to be faced, not just young people, young at heart, whatever, whatever age you, you appropriate to yourself, even though you know you lie to us and yourself. <laughs> We all have ideas about certain aspects of our life that it's hard for us to let go of and do what God yeah. wants. Yes. You know what's the one I get challenged on the most is forgiving other people. You would be amazed at how many Christians justify why they don't forgive someone. That's leading to your own understanding. It don't matter what you think about it. God has his opinion about it and his opinion is that we're supposed to forgive. So young people specifically, but all of us in general, understand that we have got to consciously and consistently acknowledge those areas where we are leaning to our own understanding. And we've got to combat those. There's a term for that, where there's certain ideas that I just can't let go of. There are certain perceptions I can't let go of, even though I know what the word says, even though I know how God feels about it. There's a, there's a term for it. Do y'all know what it is? Stronghold. They're strongholds. There's a stronghold, a fortress, a mental and emotional fortress that I have built up over time that's designed to protect me from a perceived threat. So that's what a stronghold is. It's an idea, it's a belief system, it's a way of thinking and feeling that I've built up that, uh, that uh, gives me permission to function a certain way even if it contradicts God's word. And those strongholds don't go away because we pray them away. Because that's not how the Bible tells us to deal with strongholds. The Bible tells us to pull them down. Yes. Meaning you have to actively acknowledge and participate in the process of dealing with strongholds. They don't disappear by, like magic. you got to deal with them. Number two. I said lean not to your own understanding. So number three is in all your ways acknowledge him. No, I'm sorry, I'm reading that wrong. In some of your ways, acknowledge him. In the ways that are comfortable, acknowledge him. In the ways that get public recognition. I only hear like two or three people challenge me. I mean, now, I, I know you a Bible, you a Bible preacher. You, you preach the word, I've heard you consistently. And I only hear two or three of you challenging the fact that the word of God says, in some of your ways, all. Even the ones that are uncomfortable. Even in the ways that are ugly. All of your ways. God, I'm about to cuss this person out. So I need you to intervene. Father, I'm sick of this job. I have mastered the pattern of collecting a paycheck with no output. But I know that this doesn't honor you, so I need you to help me. Father, I've been here 15 years, and I ain't been promoted yet, and I work harder than that. I, I trained half the people that have been promoted. I'm sick of this job. I hate my boss, and part of it might have to do with the, the culture that they come from. God, I need your help. All of your ways, not just the spiritual ones. Not just the ones that look good publicly. Oh. Not just the ones that put your name on a program. Oh. Not just the ones that get you the recognition you're looking for. Oh. Not just the ones that you post to people like and say, who sis, who bro, that was good. Oh. All of your ways yes. acknowledge him. Why is that important? Because when we are willing to go to God with every part of who we are, even the nasty, ugly, dirty, filthy parts, what we're saying is, God, I trust you completely. That's why the verse starts with trust in the Lord. With all your heart. Can anybody in here admit that some parts of your heart are not good? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I only see one hand up. Because I will start calling, I will start calling you all out. 
there are parts of my heart that I know are not, not right with God. But I trust him even in those parts. There are parts of my heart that I know are contrary to the word of God. But I trust him in those areas too. Yes, yes. There are things that I want to do in places I want to go. I have no, I have no business going to. But I trust him in those areas too. Young people, I want to get you out of this thinking that you've got to be perfect. That you're going to get it right all the time. Or that somehow you're fundamentally flawed because there are areas in your life that you need to work on. God says, trust me in those areas too. And lean not to my own understanding. In all of my ways, some of us got some ways. We got some ways. We got some ways. Anybody in here got some ways? We got some ways. We got some ways. Maybe Sister Dustin so is known for being the sweetest pie, but y'all don't realize she a pack rat. Brother, do you have a Brother Jenkins in the church? Okay, I don't want to think about it. Brother Jenkins show can cook. But last I heard, he beats his wife. He got some unresolved anger issues. Brother so-and-so, he is so generous, but it turns out he's a gambler. We all got some, some ways. Some ways. In all the ways. Your ways, the ways to please God, and the ways that don't. Acknowledge Him. I tell you all the story, and I'm repeating a story that I was told from from one of my spiritual mentors. A guy came to him and he said, and, and, and it's funny because uh, there's a very famous preacher that has a version of this story that he told very recently. A guy came to uh, the preacher and said, "Listen, I love God, but I I, I just can't stop smoking cigarettes." I can't stop smoking cigarettes. I, I, I need deliverance from cigarettes. I need you to pray for me that I get delivered from cigarettes. And the preacher said, well, I can't pray that God delivers you from something that you're not willing to let go of. So I can't pray that God takes something away from you that you don't believe you can be free from. So you have to actively participate. So here's what I want you to do. Every time, he said, I'm not going to tell you to stop buying the cigarettes. Because you'll stop for a while, and then when the pressures of life turn on, you're going to need that nicotine hit, and you're going to go get you uh, your, your menthol lights. Not that I know anything about cigarettes, but I haven't heard that that's what some people smoke. So you're going to get you your little menthol lights, and you're going to, like he said, when you get it, you say, I can do all things through Christ who strength this way. Maybe you open up the pack, and while you're opening it, you say, I can do all things through Christ who strength this way. Maybe you take that cigarette out and you put it to your lips. Why are you doing it? You say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe you even light that cigarette. Why are you lighting the cigarette? You say, I can do all things through Christ. You might even inhale. And while you're inhaling, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I know, I, now listen, I can hear, I can see, your, that religious bone in your body is twitching. I can see your left eye twitching and going every which way you feel. Like I'm giving y'all permission to sin. I don't need to give anybody permission to sin because you're going to do it anyway. I don't have to give nobody permission to sin. But I can, t- I can feel that religious bone in some of you twitching because it sounds like I'm giving people permission to do what they want to do. No, what I'm saying is you, people are going to do what they want to do anyway. They just, we just got real good at hiding it. If you're going to do what you're going to do anyway, at least acknowledge God in it. Sounds crazy, don't it? Sounds crazy, don't it? But the reason you do that is the more you acknowledge God in those ways that don't please him, the more you are inviting God to invade that territory and invade that space and empower you to overcome. But God won't give you the ability to overcome something you're not even acknowledging and presenting to him. So the reason you say, I can do all things through Christ. So anyway, back to the story. The man had been doing it for a while and he called that preacher up and he said, you would not believe this. I did exactly what you said. And I was probably smoking cigarettes maybe another week or two after we had that conversation. But one day, I went and I put that cigarette to my lips and I literally felt sick to my stomach. And I've not smoked since then. Now, this ain't no magic story. And it doesn't necessarily work that smoothly and that easily in all areas because some things are harder to overcome than others. But that's not the point. It's not about the degree of difficulty. It's the degree of consistency. The degree of consistency in 
acknowledging God in all of our ways. Why? So that he can direct your path. James 1, 5 through 8. James 1, pardon me. 5 through 8 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. Meaning not only does God give you the wisdom, but he don't mind giving to you. He wants to give it to you. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, mm -hmm. driven and tossed by the wind, like y'all was doing earlier with y'all, with the hair back and forth, tossed back and forth like the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, it's interesting. Do you notice that it says you won't receive something from the Lord, not because you're not getting it right, but because you're doubting? You're doubting the God's. You're doubting the God's even wants to give you the wisdom. God, I'm not handling this right. I need wisdom about what to do. I need wisdom about how to manage this space. I need two deacons quickly, 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 quickly. Two, two, two deacons that can move good. <laughs> Sue me and find out just how broke I really am. Okay, come over here. Come over here. Now, what I want you to do is I want each of you to grab an arm. So, Jane, you know, you got to get a good grip. I'm a lot stronger than I told y'all. Y'all think because I'm skinny, I don't got no muscle. I'm good. I'm strong. Now, when I tell you to, I want you to pull me that way. When you feel the resistance, you start pulling the other. Okay. I mean, use however many arms you can grab that cane and hook it around my neck. <laughs> okay, so start pulling whenever you want to. I want to serve God. Oh, but wait, but this is calling me. Uh, I, I, I want to. I want to serve. What are you trying to do? <laughs> Unstable in all 
his ways. There's that term, all his ways. Meaning, you can't fully commit to the world, <laughs> and you can't fully commit to God, because you're unstable. It cracks me up how people will say stupid stuff to me like, I got a little pride in this area. No, boo, -boo you got pride in all areas. <laughs> He, you know, some, sometimes I got an anger issue. No, sweetheart. All the time, you got an anger issue. If, if it's not in full function, it's because the other voice is talking to them. <laughs> I don't like being around folks that can't make up their mind about what they want to do. At least sinners are committed. I know what I'm getting when I'm dealing with a sinner. And I don't put an expectation on them for them to start acting like me because now I'm asking them to be just as goofy and double minded as I might be. Okay, y'all got quiet. Come on, preach. So you literally have two minds and you're at a stalemate because you're in constant mental conflict trying to balance your thoughts and perspectives with those of God. Psalm 37, 23 through 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. There's that word again. There's that word again. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. I had difficulty preparing this. I, I, I had a lot going on personally. I had I had two daughters move out yesterday, and I didn't. I agree with their ability to make a choice, and they're at the age where they should be making life choices. They're 18 and 19, but I didn't agree with the circumstance that they were moving out of, and I didn't agree with the reason for why they were moving out of my house in the first place. Um, I have a baby girl who just graduated from eighth grade. Wait, raise your hand. Hi, so they can see it. <laughs> 14 years old, uh, graduated in, in National Junior Honor Society, ladies in leadership, one of the top performers in her class, consistently makes honor roll, consistently has a 4.0, just crushing it, and then right next to her, her sister, who is just as brilliant, consistently making a merit roll, constantly seeking to improve. She's drastically improved her approach to school in general. Sixth grade was hard. Y'all remember sixth grade? Y'all remember? I do, and it was terrible. So she got grace for me this year because I remember sixth grade, but we're going we to push her to seventh and eighth grade because she has the same capabilities and intelligence that her sister does. My wife just got her master's degree. So I have to share this story, and I promise you I'm almost done. I really am. I have to share this story. So if I am not directly invested or a part of something, I will support by removing obstacles. I was support by doing check-ins and asking, hey, how's it going? How are classes going? Do you need any additional support? Are there any other resources you need? I, I may not care what classes you are taking, but I'm going to set you up so that you have the opportunity to pass those classes well. And so when my wife decided that she wanted to go get her master's, I was like, cool, no problem. I, I'll, I'll, I got the house when you're uh, in class, and I'll cook, and I'll deal with the girls, and I'll deal with homework, and, and we won't. We won't disturb you when you're studying. We won't disturb you when you're writing papers. Hey, you got a paper due? Uh, yes. Have you started on it? No. Why? <laughs> Am I lying? No. I, I wrote her about the papers because she, she, she is the queen of last minute. <laughs> the queen of last minute. <laughs> so I think when you have been about a year, a year and a half in, into her uh, master's study, and somebody said, well, you, you mentioned your wife is getting her master's. What's she getting it in? And I said, you know I don't know. <laughs> you know it never occurred to me to ask. So I went home and I said, what are you... <laughs> where, where are you getting your master's in? And she said, nah, uh, nah, non-profit administration and leadership, correct? A master's in non nonprofit administration and leadership. I said, your degree is in psychology. What in the ham sandwich made you decide to go get a master's in this weird field? Her response. <laughs> she said, Renault, I know you. You keep denying it. But one day you're going to start a church. There you go. And I know you well enough to know. You have no interest whatsoever in running a church. All you care about is people. So I figured, you deal with the people, I'll do the business of the church. My wife went to go get her master's. 
just to support a vision in me that I had the first day. She saw something in me I didn't see in me and adjusted herself to meet what she knew I would become before I knew I would become. That's why the Bible says, he that finds a wife, not a girlfriend, not a sex partner, not a buddy, not a friend, a wife. Meaning, she was already a wife when I met her. She just wasn't mine until I made her my wife. So, I'm really proud of you. I really, really am. Point is, I had a whole lot going on. And just in this weird place of starting ministry and, and wanting to honor God in the ministry and wanting to be a blessing to people and not 100% clear about what it is I'm supposed to be doing. And it ain't nothing like having a Bible study with a woman and you got 10, 15, 20 folks there and then the next one don't nobody show up. That, that'll deflate you real quick. So I was wrestling and I wasn't prepared for today and I was nervous. I'm like, I cannot do Dr. Ware wrong. I can't show to his church unprepared. I can't, I mean, these people know me and I have a relationship with them and I want to make sure that they are blessed when I'm done. Like, but I sit down, y'all should feel better and have a better understanding. So I'm wrestling and then I had to, I said, well, God, I, I need you to give me some clarity because I don't know what to do. And I remember three things. One, God knew exactly where I was going to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He, he was prepared for that. He, where I was didn't throw him off in any kind of way. Number two, he knew I was going to have this assignment. And number three, I remember that God did not bring me this far to a man. When I remember that God has the answers for his people in his word and that my foundation in Jesus and my relationship with him, regardless of what state I find myself in, I found instant peace and he laid out the roadmap to get to today's message. So folks, you need to become absolutely convinced for your need for God in every area of your life. And when life starts throwing you curveballs, when you rest in him, knowing that you can and will get through whatever you're faced with, God can get the glory. You are saying to, I've got the victory, right? Yeah. I, I want you all to understand something. Victory is not something you're trying to obtain. You already have it. You already have the victory. You, you, you're in possession. Let me just check. Do I have any blood-washed, blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ as the risen Lord? Just raise your hand. Anybody that has put their faith in Christ, then you already have the victory. What the enemy does is trick you into thinking it's something you've got to obtain, something you've got to go get. No, 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 no. You already have the victory in you. And when you remind yourself of that principle, it's amazing how many obstacles fall away. Now, I recognize I still have not answered the question, what do you do? When you don't know what to do. I haven't actually given that an answer to that question. So I'm going to give you four things. What to do when you're at an impasse in life where you're wondering what's next. Why this? Why now? What do I do? How do I respond? Where do I go? What do I do? The first is remember that time is not as important or relevant as we make it to be. My age really is not all about it. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how young you are, if you're 10 or 11, or if you're 60, 70. I, I don't, I'm not going to ask you too gentlemen how old you are, but y'all was fighting me like you were in your 20s. <laughs> what matters more is submission and obedience. The moment I choose to submit to the will of God and obey his will, I can be 10 or I can be 100. God can get the glory out of that. The Word of God is filled with examples of people at different points in their life who submitted to the will of God and God got the glory. Think about Abraham and Sarah. Think about being 85 when you're told that the promised child is going to come through your loins and 100 years old when that child is born. Think about Moses who was 40 when he escaped, when he ran away from Egypt. He was 80 when God called him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and he was 120 when he died, having brought them to the promised land. Think about Joseph, who was a young man when he was sold into slavery, and you turn around and he's the one running the prison just because he was upright and the leader of the prison recognized and saw something in him. Josiah was made king of Israel at the age of eight. Josiah was king of Israel at eight years old, and he submitted to God's will at eight years old. Timothy was a young pastor. 
Meanwhile, John the Revelator wrote Revelations when he was in his early 80s or 90s. In our moment of true submission, true willingness to lean not to our own understanding, God will light a path where each step is as clear as day. But understand this, God will only light each step. He won't light the path. He won't light the path. That word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. What does that mean? It means literally having lamps guarded to your feet in the middle of the night so that every step I take, I can see the next place I'm supposed to go. Maybe I can't see a mile down the road, but I can see the next step that I take. And then that'll tell me, okay, this is where the next place that I put my feet. I right now am in this season of step by step. Step by step, step by step. God doesn't show me everything. He says, just do this. We just, my wife just got an LLC for, for the ministry. That's just the next. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with it. No idea. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with it. But God told me repeatedly, I need you to get an LLC. Yes, sir. Okay, that's fine. That's what you want me to do. What am I supposed to do with it? You're asking too many questions. <laughs> hey, I want you to start a Bible study out of your house. Who's going to come? You're asking too many questions. I just need you to create the format. Then I created the format The people, hey, I heard you were doing a Bible study, and they started coming. Okay, now I want you to do it online. But Lord, I don't have an online father. You, you ask me too many questions. Just log in and make sure this, that, that people have access to it. So the last Bible study I did, I had one person live watching me. I was deflated. <laughs> you look at that same video, 650 people have watched it. Whether or not they watched it from beginning to end, I have no idea, but it's reached. And 650 people have clicked on that video. So maybe in the moment it doesn't look like you're making much progress, but you look up and you realize how very far you've come. So that's the first thing. Remember the time is not important. Submission and obedience is. Young people, that's specifically for you. Your age does not disqualify you from the move of God. Your age, however young you are, that doesn't disqualify you. The Holy Ghost ain't just for old folk. The Holy Ghost ain't just for old folk. The Holy Ghost ain't just for old folk. God will move through anyone that is submitted to him and willing to obey him. Number two, continue to do what you already know to do. That means two things. One, there are basic Christian principles that are true for all Christians all the time. And God will always get the glory out of your obedience to his standards. Meaning, even if I'm not sure about the next choice, the next phase of development, the next city, the next decision, how to handle certain situations, there are certain basic things I can continue to do. I can continue to love my neighbor as myself, and I can continue to love the Lord my God with all my strength, and with all my heart, and with all my soul. I can continue to make myself an accessible resource. I can continue to honor my mother and my father. I can continue to be a good steward over the resources that God has given to me. I can continue to remain accountable to the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. I can continue to have a steadfast prayer life. I can continue to make Bible study a consistent part of my life. I can do those things whether or not I know what to do, and God can still get glory out of me even when I don't know what to do, or maybe he's just telling me to stand still. And then number two, the, the second part of this concept of continuing to do what you already know to do is remember that God rarely gives new instructions to us until we have fully followed the previous instructions. Most of the time when we are complaining about not knowing what to do or what's next, we're probably in a state of disobedience because we haven't done the last thing God told us to do. I know that's a hard truth, but it, it is true. Yes. The Lord told me several years ago to start a YouTube channel, and, and he did it in the strangest way. I won't tell you the whole story, but the short version is I knew it was God showing me that this was something I was supposed to do. And I started it, and I posted maybe two videos and didn't touch it for another year. And every year, God would send me a reminder. I told you to do YouTube. I told you you need to be doing teachings on YouTube. I told you you need to post teachings on YouTube. I know you don't like social media because, by the way, I hate social media. I'm on it, but I don't like it. He kept telling me to use YouTube as a platform. He kept saying it over and over and over. And I finally submitted and started putting videos out consistently. Numbers don't matter, but this just shows you what an act of obedience can do. And when I started putting the videos out consistently, out of nowhere, I had a video that had, I think, like 16,000 views. And then I looked at the matrix of the views and literally people from all over the world were watching this video. I was talking about the concept of time and how we 
we cry so much about wasting time, and God already knew that we were going to waste time, and from his perspective, we hadn't wasted time. We've just arrived at the appointed time. So I talked about that in this video, 16,000 views. Why? Because I finally did what God told me to do the first time, and out of that came the Bible study. And out of the Bible study came the officially launching the ministry. But the, the launch of the ministry, being birthed from the Bible study, being birthed from the YouTube videos, never would have happened if I didn't birth the YouTube videos. So if I don't know what to do, I have to ask myself, did I do the last thing God told me to do? Number three, this is important. This is important, folk, young folk, old folk, everywhere in between. Acknowledge, confess, and repent of any undealt with sin. Let me say that again. Acknowledge, confess, and repent of any undealt with sin. This can block your prayers and requests from reaching heaven and block your ability to hear God clearly so that you know what the next thing to do is. Generally speaking, the other thing I found with people when they're saying, I don't know what to do, I'm not sure which way to go, it's a good chance that there's some undealt with sin. And sin doesn't always have to be horrific and, and nasty and gross. It can be something just hardness of heart. It can be somebody you need to forgive. It can be maybe you didn't make a right business decision and God's telling you to correct it and go back and apologize. It can be something simple. But those simple things that we refuse to acknowledge and repent from, they can stop us from hearing God about the direction we're supposed to go. So acknowledge it, confess it, and repent of it. And then last is while you are waiting for God to tell you what to do, wait patiently. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice that it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You make your request. And the response is not that he'll answer your prayers. It's that while you're waiting, you'll have peace, which passes understanding. And that peace will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. So you need to commit to prayer, not where we tell God what we think or what we want, but where we ask and listen for what he wants. We need to guard against complacency. We need to guard against bitterness. And we need to guard against the need for man's approval and validation. There's a difference between needing man's approval and validation versus seeking wise counsel. I know the difference between someone who is seriously looking for counsel because they don't come to me with an agenda versus someone who's already made up in their mind how they think things should be and they just want me to agree with them. I know the difference. Do you all hear that? Seek wise counsel. You should be bouncing your ideas and what you think you're hearing, what you think the word is saying about what you're supposed to be doing. You should be bouncing that off of brothers and sisters in Christ. But if you've already made up in your mind what you want God's answer to be, and you're just going to them trying to get that validation, don't waste your time. Because man's validation does not obligate God to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then last, guard against the temptation to compromise God's standard. Unanswered prayers tend to make us restless and anxious. Restlessness and anxiousness, in turn, tends to lead us back to old ideologies, old thought patterns, old behaviors. So you've got to guard against the temptation to compromise God's standard. Get in the place where you say, God, while I'm waiting, I'm still going to honor you. While I'm waiting, I'm still going to glorify you. I'm done. So I want you all to start looking for those opportunities to show yourself faithful. When somebody says they're done, you start playing softly. <laughs> Deal with your men later, because your men are off. No, no, no. Like you got, you got folks trying to beat me up in front of you. Well, they, they used to be. I'm just, you know, I'm that kind of thug. <laughs> Jesus. Start looking for those opportunities to show yourself. Like, I can't even. You, and you're gonna throw me all out. <laughs> To show yourself faithful to Jesus, even when the path is unclear, and you're waiting on the next step. What does that mean? It means that God is not obligated to answer my prayers and give me direction clearly when I want him to. 
I'm simply obligated to trust him in my process. And trusting him looks like obedience. Trusting him looks like consistency. Trusting him looks like denouncing worldview in favor of the Christian worldview. In other words, I trust the word. I don't trust what you tell me because what you tell me don't sound like the word. What you tell me don't sound like Bible. What you tell me don't sound like what my pastors tell me. You tell me something different. I don't trust that. I trust God. Doing that will bring honor and glory to you. Doing that will give you the peace that you think the answer to your prayer will bring. I'm okay with being peace, being at peace with waiting. Now, yeah, I'd rather have my prayers answered. I'd rather have God show up like a golden ray of light in my room and say, my son, this is what I want you to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, God ain't never done that to me. He ain't never done that to me. And probably never will. And that's okay. Because I trust him. He's proven that he's faithful. Can I be faithful while I wait? Amen and amen. God bless y'all. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. We can work with you and come alongside you, as he said, to help you in this journey to be a great Christian. Because God has called you, and if he's talking to your heart right now, will you come and let God have his way with you? The doors of the church are open. Will you today admit that you cannot do this by yourself? Will you abolish the spiritual schizophrenia that you're dealing with? Will you learn to walk by faith and not by sight? Will you come at this moment? And trust God with your life. Because he gave it to you. There is no one better and more suited to provide for you in ways you will never be able to know. Will you come now and surrender your life unto Jesus? You've done all you can. All you can do. Yes, Lord. Yeah. 
Samson theory is real. David's died on the corner of Broadway, Grassman, where the neon lights are what? Bright. I say bright. So they therefore they've been endued in by the power of the Holy Spirit to have supernatural ability and strength beyond that of a mortal man. All right, now that's why these some bad men we got around here. Because as you use the word wishbone, we can look at two parts of you. <laughs> But all of that being said, young people, all y'all young people are here. We don't think it's just y'all three. Besides me and some other young people in here. Listen to what he said. Listen to what he said. You have got to be committed in your life and in your walk to follow after Christ. And it is paramount. All of us that are here got here because we got around people that can take us. Through. You need mentorship. You need spiritual guidance. And that is the purpose of a church family. If you look around in here, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of skills. There's a lot of ability. And you know what? There's a lot of life lessons learned from when we hit our heads. That we can share with you all that y'all create a new problem. Like social media to deal with. But know this. Wherever you go, never be afraid to ask for help. From those that are willing to help you. And don't make somebody come alongside you. If you, they don't want to come, let them stay where they are. They can't go with those that love you. And know your relatives from your friends. That'll hit you better. People don't like to say it. All your relatives are not your friends. Your friends will take a bullet with you. And if you look back in the Bible, who killed Jesus is relatives. That was his family. You have to know who is your friend. And as he said so eloquently, that means you need to know Jesus first. So Jesus will give you that spirit of discernment to know who can pour life into you and who you can run with. That will determine a large part of your victory. It is yours already. And that song, what are y'all saying? Victory is mine. It is victory. It is yours. So when you leave this place and everywhere you go, always remember every young person in here, y'all can come back to Christian Union Baptist Church. For worship and for advice, we are here. So, as you have a few words to say, if you're ready to get out of here, you can send us come home. As always, I'm honored and just grateful that you all are so warm and inviting and you accept my crazy self. Y'all do know I was joking, right? Okay. And I have to clarify that because I don't want them to beat me up in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, no. I just, I want no smoke. I want no smoke. I don't. No, my hips don't do what they used to do, so I can run as fast. No, seriously, thank you all so much. Um, it's easier to pour in this environment. I, I can literally sense the love. I can sense the open vessel. You all make it easy to preach here. I, you, you do it every single time. And God always meets us here. He always honors our willingness to hear from him, myself included. Whenever I write a sermon, I write it to me first. So I love you all so much. Can we stand?
Can we very quickly just stretch our hands to Mother Nickerson? Father, we trust you. Father, we lift up this mighty woman of God to you. We lift up her family to you right now. Father, we don't presume to know everything about what you're doing, but we trust your sovereignty. We trust that you have all knowledge and you possess all wisdom and that whatever you're doing, even if it doesn't feel good, it's for our good. Father, send strength and peace to her right now in the name of Jesus. Bring a calmness over her in her house of hope in the name of Jesus. Give them wisdom and strategy about how to maneuver. May you touch the doctor's hands and touch the doctor's minds that are caring for her son. May, may they operate with precision and accuracy and identify the problem and give them wisdom and clarity on how to bring about the cure, Father. And no matter what you decide, we say, it is well. It is well. And Father, bless we, your people. I lift up this entire congregation from the leader down to the lay person. Continue to move on their behalf, Father. We thank you for expansion. We thank you for resources. We thank you that this is a pillar in the community. We thank you that people are going to be drawn to this ministry because of the love for one another. We thank you that you are increasing us in love. You are increasing us in wisdom. You are increasing us in stature. And we ask all these things. And we ask you to give us travel mercies to our various destinations, Father. We cancel accidents and car crashes and sleepiness, Father. Let the, the rest of today be a day of rest and recovery and recuperation for all of us, Father. We ask all these things in that name that is above every name, the creator of the universe, Jesus, the son of the living God. Amen. 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 Amen.